Hi guys, this is New Sensei. Now, I've mentioned in previous videos that I deal with a lot of questions. Uh, I haven't exactly counted how many questions, but I'd say on average, uh, from the internet alone, uh, that's probably between 5 to 10 questions per day. Uh, that means in a given month, that's probably around 150 to 300 questions asked by the internet about archery. So that's actually quite a lot of questions. While I do try my best to answer every question I can, admittedly, I sometimes just don't have time. Uh, that said, the questions which are asked are usually very good, and I think that the general viewer base deserves to know about the knowledge being passed around so that they too can learn from other people. I've decided to start a new monthly Q&A series, uh, focusing on archery of course, of the Can Ask Other Questions. Uh, you can send me questions through Facebook or YouTube or through email, uh, or I will pick my favourite questions that have been sent to me during the month. Now do bear in mind that this is meant to be a quick Q&A session, it's not meant to be a video request thing. So if it's a very big question that requires a big topic then I might save it for a different time. These are only the quick questions which people want to know about. So the first ever question for news Q&A is from Andrew. Now Andrew actually has a very big question and basically he's concerned that his club or his team isn't very well organised and this is actually a very common problem in some clubs. Uh, the problem is that they, the shooters at the club don't take care of the club facilities and equipment, they leave a mess around the tables and so on, and Andrew wants to know uh, what can be done to help address this issue. I should have picked an easier question. But seriously, this is a very big problem with clubs in general. Uh, any sports club will have this sort of problem too. Um, the way I would approach this is to address the club committee, if there is one, or the team committee. Uh, I know there are problems with the leadership or the captains not pulling their weight and so on, but it's something which is... It's, it's systematic. It's not like one person is making a mess or people being careless. It's starting to develop into a club culture. And if this doesn't stop, then what will happen is more people will get uh, frustrated, more people will get angry, and more people will leave. Now, I'm not saying that you should leave the club because people are leaving arrows lying around, but what I'm saying is you should address this as a whole group in the forum that is available to you. It may be contacting the team leader one-on-one -on -one or by email. It may be having a club meeting. Um, these things have to be done at a club organizational level. Uh, as an individual, um, you could approach people and actually be positive and support them by showing them the right way of doing things, by uh, walking them through the correct uh, cleanup protocols or what to do when their stuff is missing or stuff's lying around. That's what you should be doing. But if people aren't listening and if people just want to chuck the stuff around and uh, no one wants to work together, then the ultimate step is to vote with your feet. Uh, if no one's going to listen to the issues, then that's when people start withdrawing, that's when people start leaving the club. Um, and that's probably the ultimate feedback that a club committee will get, is if people don't stay with the club. So from the club committee perspective, you've got to support your members, that means listen to the concerns, if you don't listen, there will be issues and people won't stay. Gobble Leon from Germany, Guten Tag. Will the Samic Polaris last me one to two years? Firstly, the Samic Polaris is a fantastic bow. It is probably the um, ubiquitous beginner bow. Now, not the Samic Sage. Samic Sage is a hunting bow uh, that's suitable for beginners. The Samic Polaris is what a beginner bow ideally is. Uh, will it last one to two years? Uh, that's actually pushing it. Um, this actually depends on what your archery goals are. Uh, I mean, uh, people can pick the Polaris and shoot it forever if they don't want to shoot another bow or if they, if they don't want to compete or hunt. So I can't give you a time frame as to how long a Polaris will last you in terms of learning. It's a very good bow to learn with, but people who buy beginner bows might outgrow them in three months or six months or three years, depending on how fast they progress and what they want to accomplish with their bow. Uh, that said, uh, I mean, I would definitely recommend the Polaris as the first bow if there's nothing else available to you. Uh, but by the time you get through, say, six months to a year, you'll probably start having a better idea as to what kind of archery you want and what kind of bow suit you. Next, 
Dan has a good question. And to sum up, the question is, how do I measure progression? Uh, the context for this question was in regards to martial arts, where you learn more advanced forms and kata and techniques, whereas in archery, it seems to become like a dead end, like you don't really feel progression. Outside of scoring and rankings and getting medals and badges, archery actually doesn't have much in terms of personal development. Um, the difference with martial arts and archery is that archery is a single action. Uh, you only learn to draw a bow and shoot, that, that's really all there is to it, there's no advanced shooting technique. Uh, you will learn to dissect your skill and process a lot more accurately with practice. That's something that internally you can measure in some way. Uh, you can understand the parts of your shot process more specifically and especially when you are instructing others or helping others. So you can diagnose things like equipment problems, form problems and so on. Uh, in my opinion, the skill progression in archery is not one of going upwards, but going laterally. You learn diverse skills. That means you might be learning different styles of shooting. So instead of shooting traditional only, you might shoot traditional and modern. Um, or you might shoot target and field or clout, or flight, and so on. So there, there, there are different disciplines which can appeal to people and you can learn. Uh, apart from that, you can learn different skills within your discipline. And that includes things like uh, making strings. Um, these are just one of the small things which you can learn and become a better all-round archer, which may be what you are thinking of when it comes to personal progression. John asks, is a 25 pound bow too light? No. 25 pounds is a great starting point. It's just heavy enough to feel like you're actually shooting, but not too heavy where most people can't handle the weight. Um, ideally, your bow should be a weight which you can comfortably draw back and hold for around 30 seconds. That means you can learn good form and shoot without getting tired. Alistair asks, how about a 10 pound bow? Um, I had to uh, double check this because I thought you might be missing a zero somewhere. Uh, 10 pounds, that's really, really light. Uh, you can't normally find a bow that comes in 10 pounds. Um, the, the actual um, bow in mind was actually an eBay Chinese horse bow, which went from 10 pounds to like 80 pounds. So it wasn't a reliable um, uh, bow. But the question is 10 pounds. Uh, yeah, way too light. I mean, even this toy uh, bow, uh, mini compound bow, is probably heavier than 10 pounds. Uh, seriously, um, I mean, uh, our beginners, uh, junior and senior, shoot 18 to 24 pounds. That's a pretty standard thing. Um, we have like 15 pound like, kids' bows for like 8 year olds, but 10 pounds is like not a bow. Um, you can pretty much like throw an arrow faster and further than a 10 pound bow. Another question from John, how do you train in the wind? Everyone will agree that wind is the most frustrating factor in archery. There's simply no way around it. Apart from shooting indoors, uh, you can't avoid training in wind and you will shoot in windy conditions. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind is that the wind will mess you up. It will mess everyone up too. So all the fine tuning, all the very small micro techniques in your shot process will be messed up. Like It's very hard to maintain good flow and expansion and rhythm when you're fighting against the wind. That's to be expected. So, a couple of things. Firstly, expect to let yourself down a lot. Uh, you'll be coming up to your full draw, wind blows, you lose your tension, let down. Um, that's fairly normal and people expect this. The second thing is to expect a bit less of yourself. Um, the wind will naturally uh, increase your dispersion. Your arrows won't group as tightly, it will drift to the side, so there's not much you can really do about it. Your scores on average will be lower in windy conditions. So don't be too hard on yourself. Question from Skylar, uh, what are your targets made from? Originally, our targets were made from Stramit. That's a, uh, a densely packed straw material. Um, and it's normally used for insulation. Uh, we have layers of those. And they do last quite a while. Uh, wet weather does make them a little hard, but they do the job quite well. Uh, we ran out and we couldn't source any locally, so we switched over to plastic. 
Uh, the plastic we use is the pallet wrapping, which you get from warehouses and the, uh, the big hardware stores. They have tons of this lying around and they really want to get rid of it. Uh, we've got a few members who work in warehouses and so on, so uh, we do get this for free quite easily. Uh, we put it into a giant press and we squeeze them together and we place it to a wooden frame and then we cut the tires, it expands, so it fills the space quite well. The key to using plastic is to make it really dense, that way the arrows don't go through. Um, the other thing is uh, foam. Now a lot of clubs will use a foam target or especially a foam center. Foam's very expensive. Um, we don't personally use uh, foam in our club, I know other clubs do, uh, but foam is probably the best material for a uh, target. Uh, my personal target at home, which is the, the block target, that's foam. Uh, probably, again, the best material, uh, but probably not affordable unless your club is really, really wealthy. Bjorn asks, what do you think of the quick disconnect systems on stabilizers? Personally, I don't really see a point. Yes, you can detach them with one press, but it takes around three seconds to screw in a stabilizer anyway, so you're not really saving that much time. Randy has pointed out how silly my bucket hat looks, and he asks, can you go without one? Just remember, I do live in Australia. Um, that's a pretty hot summer, and uh, fortunately I tan rather than burn, uh, but you know, no kidding, we have one of the highest cancer rates in the world, so uh, being sun smart and wearing a hat is something which I would expect uh, as a matter of health and safety rather than for fashion. Clorin uh, asked, is a Samix Sage a good bow? Yes. Levi asked, how often do you train? I try to train every evening, every couple of evenings. Uh, the biggest factor is my after hours commitments. That's mostly work and after hours work. Um, I do shoot regularly at the club at least once a week as a club shoot and training session. But personally, I try to get in maybe two, three, maybe four times a week. Um, I prefer to have regular uh, frequent sessions rather than big single sessions. You learn more that way, you retain more. Uh, I try to go for an hour for a personal practice session, but if I go to the club, I want to spend you know two, three, even four hours uh, doing training work and shooting rounds and so on. Tyler and about a hundred other people have asked, what bow do I use? I use a Win and Win Inno CXT that hasn't changed for the past three years. Bjorn asks, on what authority do you criticize Lars? Wow, a Lars Anderson question. It's been a while. Firstly, I don't consider myself to be a Lars critic. I actually do like what he does, and uh, I don't disagree with most of it. Uh, just a few of the side comments I found were kind of misleading. So I want to turn the question around. On what authority does Lars criticize modern archery? From what I know, he's not a modern target shooter, and he's not a historian. He has a very good style of archery. Um, he's a very fast shot and a very uh, talented, hard-working trick shooter. So all credit to Lars for pulling together and demonstrating a new style of archery. But uh, reading a few historical texts and inventing or reinventing a style of archery doesn't automatically give you the license to uh, criticize or speak authoritatively on certain topics which are outside of your expertise. Likewise, I, I can't criticize traditional shooting methods because I'm not a trad shooter. So, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I, I don't think Lars is doing anything wrong necessarily, but I think some of the claims that he's made don't reflect his actual expertise and a lot of people confuse skill for expert knowledge of particular fields. Um, that doesn't necessarily correlate He's a great archer, but he's not necessarily a good historian. Brent has a question, is it normal for your first string to come out bad? Yes, as of anything, strings take a bit of skill and finesse and experience to do well. Uh, your first string, especially if you're doing a more complex design like multicolored strings, it will be hard to get things to turn out right. It took me many attempts, um, and my first like dozen weren't that great until I figured out what I was doing wrong. Uh, so it's a learning process, you, you will become faster and better at making strings with practice. Now that said, uh, I've taught uh, quite a few people to make strings one-on-one, and for some reason, their strings always turn out perfect. 
Maybe I'm a good teacher, but that makes me feel bad because their strings are better than my strings. On the first go. Question from Sir Awesome. Have you ever tried shooting a compound bow? Um, I've held many, uh, but I haven't actually shot a compound bow. Comment by Adam. Nice shirt. Did something get sponsored by Win and Win? No, I'm not sponsored by Win and Win. I do own a lot of products from Win and Win. That includes their bow and their finger tab and their cat shaped arrow puller. Um, and I do have a lot of shirts. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, um, they're nice, comfortable shirts. Two, they're blue. I, look, I like blue more than red, so it looks nice on me, I think. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not sponsored by any company. All my gear that I personally use is self funded and self bought. So I'm personally not affiliated with any business or company. Um, I'm not a staff shooter. I'm not personally sponsored. Uh, some organizations and businesses have sponsored a particular project. Uh, they include Australian Target Archery Magazine, um, Astra Archery, and Three Rivers Archery. Uh, but I am personally not sponsored. Question from Nicholas. Are uh, feathers or veins better for hunting? They pretty much do the same thing, so they're equal. Question from Social Engineering. Do your neighbours hate you for practicing in backyard? Uh, so far, no. Uh, I've had no complaints about the noise. Uh, it's not that loud. It sounds loud, but it's actually not that loud. Um, there's a lot of echoing because I do shoot under a shelter, um, but the sound dissipates quite easily. I do live in a fairly quiet neighbourhood, but it's not much louder than regular backyard activities. Um, if a kid's you know, running around the street or kicking a soccer ball, that's probably louder. Um, additionally, there are bigger distractions. Um, I've got like a, a plane flying overhead every three minutes, a train every five minutes. It actually makes filming in the backyard very frustrating because it's so loud. Uh, so I'm surprised that people even notice me shooting in the backyard. From Gaming God, do you think buying a bow from Compass website or Amazon? I'm not actually sure what the question is, but if the question is, do I think it's better to buy from a company website, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Amazon, it's, it's not a bad service. It's a typical shopping service, but it isn't a specialist. That's the problem. If you buy from a company website, or especially the retailers, like the big ones like Lancaster, Merlin, Three Rivers, uh, Pat Archery, Abbey Archery, and so on, uh, if you buy from an archery store, you will get much more support. That means any questions you have, you can ask the store. If you want them to take care of things for you, like pick the right arrow or recommend me with some items, they will do it for you. Even if you don't go in person, doing it online, it's much better than buying from Amazon. Amazon is very anonymous. You won't get any support before, during, or after the purchase. Mans Cho asks, are you from New Zealand? No. Konstantinos asked me a question. His problem was that he put his arrow points into the shaft without glue and he couldn't get them out and he broke a couple of shafts. Uh, he asked what's wrong. There's nothing actually wrong with this. Uh, some points um, are a very tight fit into their shafts. This isn't actually a bad thing. Uh, you generally do want some tight fitting points because points have a tendency to come off. Um, that said, uh, a bit unlucky that you couldn't get your points out. Um, you're generally not meant to um, test them out by putting them in. Uh, you only insert them with glue when you're ready to put them together. Uh, you're not meant to um, put them outside for fun because you will find they will stay and you can break your arrows. Claire has several questions about string maintenance. Firstly, what do you need to do to maintain a string? Uh, string maintenance is very simple. The only thing you really need to do is to wax it every now and then. You do that by getting your stick of bow wax and your string. You rub the wax onto the string and then you use your fingers to really get it into the string itself. You want to make sure the individual strands have a nice coat. That way they're lubricated. They won't uh, rub against each other uh, when you're shooting so there's less wear and tear. How do you know when to wax? A string that hasn't been waxed for quite a while will be very dry to touch and you'll see very fine hairs which are sticking out which is quite normal but that's a big sign that the string has been waxed for too long and you should wax there and then. Next question is how do you know if you need more twist? This is a tuning issue. 
Um, one thing is brace height. Make sure your brace height stays the same each time you string the bow. Uh, if you measure your brace height and it's different, that means the string may have been untwisted and you need to twist it back to restore your original brace height. Uh, there are a couple other reasons. Uh, firstly, if you are doing tuning, one factor is the uh, sound of your bow. Uh, bows will sound differently uh, at different brace heights, so that's when you might need to add or remove twist. Um, and if you do some tuning, then uh, adding and removing twist will also increase or decrease the velocity of the bow. Um, not something you really, really need to do, but it's mostly a brace height thing. Lastly, is there anything special you need to do when unstringing a bow? Uh, yes, there is. Um, while you can just put the string into your bag as is, you may find the string will untwist by itself, as I said before. So what you can do is take the two string loops and thread them through each other once, twice, and you get this uh, ad hoc uh, knot. It's not really a knot, but you get this... Um, uh, loop within a loop that prevents the string from twisting by itself. You can then fold it uh, and then put it into your bag normally um, and that way you're guaranteed not to lose any twists. Question from Daniel. Why do most experienced archers release the hold on the bow and let it flop forward? The principle behind this is that you want to minimize the amount of tension on the bow hand. Having too much tension means that you will create torque on the bow. That means you'll be twisting it left or right, um, or up or down, and so on. So at full draw, you have less control over the bow's uh, steadiness. There's more shake. And the more tense you are, the more inconsistent it will be. So by letting the bow go, what you are doing is not holding the bow at all. There's no uh, grip. So the fingers are off the riser. Um, and most people will put it on the side or just very lightly curled off the riser and when you pull it back it actually sits back to your hand um, you're not forcing it forward it's, you're pulling it back and it sits between your thumb and forefinger without any extra effort the result is if you don't use a sling the bow will jump out by itself that means there's nearly zero tension on the bow grip and that's another variable that has been eliminated. Naturally, if you're not using a sling, the bell will jump out. If you are using a sling, um, with a full stabilizer setup, the bow will tip forward because of the forward weight. Uh, if you're shooting bare bow, the bell will typically kind of hop on your hand and fall backwards. Uh, that's a bare bow problem, uh, but fairly normal. Again, if it's jumping out freely, then you're doing it right. It means you have less pressure on the bow the opposite is that death grip. Having too much tension means you simply can't control the bow at full draw. John asks, are you supposed to get any sort of pain in your body? Generally, no. Apart from string slaps um, and feeling sore, you shouldn't feel pain. Pain is normally a sign that you're doing something wrong. Um, and depends on what your pain is. Uh, the most common injuries come from the shoulders, it's normally the drawing shoulder but not rotating correctly and using your arm to pull back rather than your back muscles. That's one source of pain. The front bow shoulder can also be painful if you're coming up and not aligning properly. Um, the question here was the bow hand. If the bow hand is painful, um, that to me might indicate too much tension. But some of these issues are more complex. Uh, you might have to see uh, a more advanced physician rather than asking coach. Chris asked, where did you get the name New Sensei? I made the handle from two parts. The first part is uh, my job. I am a teacher and Sensei means teacher in Japanese, something which is generally quite well recognized. Uh, the second part are my letters NU. Um, those are actually my timetable letters. Uh, my workplace generates initials for every teacher uh, to put on the timetable and for internal uh, purposes. Uh, NU was my generated uh, initial. Uh, it's been now changed to a three letter system, so I'm now NUD, but I don't think Nude Sensei has the right image. Question from K How do you repair bales? Uh, we actually don't. Um, bells are very hard to repair. You basically replace them. It depends on what material you use. Uh, straw needs to be replaced. Uh, if you're using layers, like stramet layers like we used to, 
Um, you'll find that the center ones will take the most damage, so you rotate the center ones out to the top and bottom and put the fresher ones into the middle. Uh, if you're using plastic, then again, you have to take the whole target down, remove the cover, replace the plastic packing, and put it back together. You can't really fix the target, but you can replace it. The other way uh, is to use a core. Um, because the center of the target takes the most wear and tear, hopefully, um, that part needs the most replacing. Some uh, clubs will put a separate uh, section, like a bag in canvas packed with plastic, and that becomes the uh, replaceable part. The rest of the target doesn't need that much replacing. Um, the other option is use a foam core. Again, very expensive, but if you're only buying the foam core, it does reduce the price. So you can replace the core, uh, which will last quite a while, and keep the outside as straw or plastic. I need to ask, how do wrist slings work? Wrist slings and finger slings work the same way, uh, but the question here was in relation to thumb arthritis. Uh, so if you do suffer pain in the joints, the finger sling will put power, pressure on this joint when you uh, retain the bow and drop it. Uh, the wrist sling works the same way, except instead of uh, hanging off your fingers, it's hanging off your wrist, which for a lot of people is a lot more comfortable and that may be your solution. Final question from Ragnar, how do you find out what you're doing wrong? First, you have to establish what you're doing right. Uh, this is something which you may find you acquire in your first few sessions. You get the feeling of a great shot. Everything feels right. You come in, you release the arrogance where you want it to, you feel the right muscle engagement and body feedback. That's when you know it's a good shot. The bad shots you can normally tell because it doesn't feel right. Physically, something feels out of line. That's usually your first clue. The second clue is arrows not going when you want them to. By combining these two sources of feedback, the target and your physical feedback, you will probably have to pick out some of the issues which plague you. Archery problems are normally attributed to one of three things. Uh, it's either a technique or form problem, it's an equipment problem or it's a mentality problem. What you find is sometimes you might think it's something you're doing wrong, but it's actually something wrong with the bow. Uh, an example recently, one of my friends is using a 40 pound uh, bare bow and he was struggling to hold 40 pound. He's a very strong guy, but he couldn't shoot properly because the bow felt too tense and he thought that he was too weak or he wasn't doing it right. What was actually wrong was that um, the string was too short and the bow was overstrung. Uh, so the bow was already under a lot of tension before he even started. Um, when we changed the string for the correct length, everything felt fine. The bow felt smooth and light the way it should be. So, you know, we, we could have spent months, if not years, getting frustrated and giving up over a problem which didn't exist. It's actually something else. So uh, if you're struggling with shooting well, then think about those three areas. Equipment, technique, or mentality. Anyway, this concludes the first monthly Q&A. Uh, if you have your own questions to ask, feel free to send them to me through Facebook, email, or on YouTube, or this video. Um, this is New Sensei. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.